Yeah, whatever. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you all to First Baptist Church this morning. We're going to start off just worshiping our King this morning. I'd love you to stand. If at any time you feel you need to step down, need to sit, God lets you worship however you can worship him, whatever position that is in. So as long as you're lifting him up and giving him glory, he's good with it. You ready? Let's worship our King. Worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. Oh, tell of His might, oh, sing of His grace, Whose robe is the light, whose canopy stays, his chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds born, and dark is his path on the wings of the storm. You alone are the matchless king, to you alone be all majesty, your glories and wonders what tongue can recite. You breathe in the air, you shine in the light. Oh, measureless might, ineffable love, while angels delight to worship above. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. You breathe in the air, you shine in the light. You alone are the matchless king, to you alone be all majesty. Your glories and wonders, what tongue can recite? I'm 
Sometimes we have the real privilege of not only seeing somebody come to know Christ as their Savior, but also when they choose to walk with God. And, and Carla has made that choice today. She talked to me a couple of weeks ago and says, I'm ready to be baptized. I says, good. So here we are this morning to take care of this. Carla, do you know Christ as your personal Savior? Is it your desire by entering these waters of baptism that you want your life to reflect Christ? Yes. Okay? Yes. Come around. Okay. okay, I want you to grab my arm and I'm gonna put this, yeah, right over my watch. I'm gonna put this over. Therefore, my sister, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Buried with them in baptism. <laughs> Raised the newness of life. I 
stuff. That's very good. Very encouraging. To see someone take that step of publicly proclaiming that they are now following Christ. Something we need to do every day. Don't keep it bottled up. Don't keep it under a bushel. But let people know that you are Christ's. That he is holding you. And he can hold them too. To do that, we have to run to him every day. Every moment, it seems like. Because we can't do that in our own strength. It's his and his alone. It's his calling and his alone.
standing for the reading of the word. I encourage you to turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of Luke, chapter 22, Luke 22, beginning in verse 14. Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 14. 
When the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. Then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and gave thanks, broke it, gave it to them and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for how you speak. And Lord, we need that right now. We need you to, to show us, to enlighten us, to give us what we can't get on our own. We need you. Lord, open our ears and our eyes and our hearts to what you want. And may we glorify you in our response. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. This morning I'm going to tell you a story, and it's going to be a number of stories wrapped into one, but it's not a story that maybe you would hear um, in a fairy tale or make-believe. I love bedtime stories. I, I love the idea of uh, letting your mind work through the, the narrative and the, the ex excitement and the adventure and then uh, drifting off to sleep, but this story is a little different because what it tells us is, is not something where you say once upon a time. Because this story began before time even began, and it's not they lived happily ever after. Well, not in this world anyway. This story has a number of elements within the story, so what I want to do, if you'll bear with me just for a few minutes this morning, I'm going to tell you the story. And it starts with the story of the Exodus. To understand the Exodus, you've got to get an idea of what happened in the Old Testament. If you have your Bibles with you, we're going to look at a passage in just a second, but you've got to, you've got to see the whole book. It isn't just about Jesus coming, which is huge. It's the climax. It isn't just about Adam and Eve, which we needed that for the beginning. And it's not just about the ending. It's all inclusive. It's literally his story, history. And when we get to the book of Exodus, something's been happening that's been building up that we've got to be sure that we understand what's going on. If you'll remember Father Abraham, he had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. You remember that he was, he was the father of our faith. It wasn't because he obeyed the law because the law hadn't even been written yet. It was because he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And then what happens as we get into the New Testament is the wonderful truth of how Paul and others bring out in, in living terms, a living color about how we have that same faith. So it isn't about us obeying the law, it's about our faith. So Father Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, you with me so far? If none of this sounds familiar, you got a lot of reading to do, but you'll, do, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. You can catch up. So Father Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob struggled with God. He wrestled with God. God renamed him Israel. And because of that, Jacob had 12 sons, 12 sons of Jacob, 12 sons of Israel. One of his sons, by his favorite wife, which we won't even go there. You shouldn't say that out loud if you even think it. And even having more than one wife, you have a whole problem. It doesn't matter. Anyway, Joseph was Jacob's son. And Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. Boy, talk about sibling rivalry. Because he was the favorite of the father, Joseph was abused and, and, and sold into slavery by his brothers. He was sold into slavery into Egypt. That's how Abraham's children eventually ended up in Egypt. Well, Joseph, starting as a slave, as a prisoner, a number of, of rough patches, finally rose to the top because of God's using him and, and, and his, his God's power through him. He gets to the top and he becomes number two to Pharaoh, which is pretty awesome. He's learned the language, he dresses and acts the culture, and there's a famine in the land, which is part of the reason I'm going to leave that one for you. You've got to go read it yourself. It's really a cool story. It's all true. See, all of this is true because the author, he can't lie. So Joseph he is number two to Pharaoh. There's a famine in the land. His brothers come to Egypt to look for food, some way to survive. And when they get there, they see Joseph, but they don't recognize Joseph. 
boy, you talk about drama. And because of that, Joseph has a, a, a fun cat and mouse, you stole from me, you're, you're against me, you're spies in the land. He just has all sorts of maybe too much fun. He enjoyed it just a little bit too much. Anyway, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, he delivers his brothers and his father from, from starvation. They all come to Egypt and they multiply. And when I say multiply, I don't mean that they just had a couple of kids. I mean they start to outnumber the Egyptians. They get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the scripture says, as you move into the book of Exodus, which is ironic because Exodus is about the Exodus. As you move into Exodus, you, you see they get bigger and bigger, larger and larger, more and more. And Pharaoh dies, the brothers of Joseph, and Joseph dies. But no one, the Pharaoh, the new Pharaoh, he doesn't remember Joseph. All he sees is all of these Hebrews, these Israelites, these chosen people. And he's not okay with how big they're getting, so he has this bright idea, let's make them slaves. Let's press down on them so they won't realize how powerful they really are, and let's, let's capture them so far. You with me so far? Here's the story. I'm, I'm still going. So as, as, as he's doing this to them, the Israelites, they come into captivity, oppression, slavery, and the Pharaoh says, this is, this is getting too much. I tell you what, I'm going to recruit the two midwives who help give birth to the children of Israel, the, the children that are born, and I'm going to have them, if a son is born, I want, him, I want the two ladies to kill the son. If it's a girl, let her live. Well, the Egyptian midwives, I mean the Hebrew midwives, they disobey Pharaoh, and God honors them for that disobedience. So he says, wait a minute, this isn't working. We got to do something. So Pharaoh tells all of the people all over Egypt, as soon as you see a baby boy who's, a, who's an Israelite, who's a Hebrew, kill him. You see how this is not, this is not soft and fluffy. So in enters Moses' parents. She has a boy. She doesn't want to kill her son. She raises him for a few months, two, three months, until he's too big to hide. And he, she makes this little basket and puts the little baby in a basket. Miriam, the sister, older sister, watches as he floats down the river. And Pharaoh's daughter is near the river, sees the basket, adopts the boy. Moses, a Hebrew, becomes an Egyptian by adoption. It's kind of cool. He grows up. He kills one of the Egyptians because the Egyptian hurts his brother, his Hebrew brother. Pharaoh finds out about it, tries to kill Moses. Moses runs away. Moses goes into the desert. And if you've ever heard, and honestly, it's not that I envy you, but it's so cool to read this for the first time. As Moses in, is in the desert running away, there's this bush that sets on fire but doesn't burn. And God speaks to Moses through the bush. And he says those classic words, go to Egypt, let my people go. He uses Moses to go back to Egypt to get them out of slavery, out of captivity. And the part that I love about this is that the, Egypt, the Egyptians are oppressing the Israelites and in the midst of the slavery, in the midst of the oppression, they're crying out to their God. They're saying, Lord, help me. And he says to Moses, I've heard their cry. I'm here to help. We're going to deliver them out of slavery. Now, to get an idea of, of what's happening, I want you to turn with me to Exodus, the book of Exodus. I'm just going to share a couple of verses with you. First one is Exodus chapter 6. This is as Moses is being told what to do and how to do it. The problem in the story of Exodus is that they were in slavery. They were in captivity. The solution is God answering prayer and the covenant that God had made. So Exodus chapter 6, verse 2. Then God said to Moses, telling him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but I was not known to them by my name, the Lord. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land they lived in as aliens. Furthermore, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are forcing to work as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Abraham was credited as righteous because of his faith, entered into a covenant with God, and God said, when I make a deal, when I make an agreement, when I make a testament, when I make a covenant, I keep it. Whether the other person has anything to do with it or not, I keep my word. 
You see, the author not only cannot lie, the author is faithful, always faithful. And so he sends Moses into Egypt, back home, so to speak, and Moses goes to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh says, who are you, and who do you think, what do you think you're doing? Moses says, let my people go. Pharaoh says, nope. And so you've got these, uh, these magicians that Pharaoh employs to do these tricks, nothing close to what God through, does through Moses. Because you see, magic's not the same thing as supernatural. Magic is just mirrors and smoke. What Moses was doing was God, as the creator, giving him the ability to do. So you can't mess with God. You might, write, you might want to write that down. Anyway, so Moses against Pharaoh. Pharaoh says no. Moses says you better. Pharaoh says no. Moses says you better. So finally, there are these plagues. And in the midst of the plagues, every time, most every time, God would do something to the children, to the Egypt, so that the children of Israel would be released. And every time, Pharaoh would say, okay, fine, leave. And then God would harden Pharaoh's heart. That's important. Because sometimes we think man has control over man. We really got to get that idea of our head. Because God hardened Pharaoh's heart, water turning to blood, frogs, lice, flies, livestock pestilence, boils, hail, locusts. There was one, the ninth plague, just utter darkness. Nighttime as if it were day. And every time Pharaoh would bend, but God would harden his heart, and then we'd do it again, again and again and again. The final plague was the worst of them all. In the final plague, God told Moses to tell Pharaoh, the angel of death is going to go through your whole country, and he is going to kill the firstborn from the highest throne to the lowest stable. Whether you be a maidservant, whether you be, you be the most important uh, political figure, doesn't matter, firstborn, you will die. But he went to the Israelites and he said, wait, there's a way for you to be saved from the judgment. There's a way for you to be secure in the midst of the death. I want you to take a lamb or a goat, year old, no blemish, and I want you to kill the lamb and put the blood, because the blood is big. Blood represents life. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. He says, I want you to take the blood and I want you to put it above the door, on the top and on the sides. And I want you to go inside the house where the blood is over the door. And when the angel comes, goes through the city, the whole countryside, the angel will pass over where the blood is. So you can be secure and safe behind the blood. And what God tells Moses to tell Pharaoh is that all of Egypt is going to wail and cry on that night like they never have before and they never will again. He says, but in, but in, in the land of Israel, where the Israelites are staying, not even a dog will bark. It'll be so quiet. They'll be safe. Another passage in Exodus. Let me show you this real quick. Exodus chapter 12, verse 11. As God has given Moses command about this Passover and what it's going to do, he's also telling him, I want you to remember this. I want you to celebrate it again and again and again, year after year, at the same time. The month of Nisan, 10th day to the 14th day. Exodus chapter 12, verse 11. Here's how you must eat it. You must be dressed for travel, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You are to eat it in a hurry. It is the Lord's Passover. I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and strike every firstborn male in the land of Egypt, both people and animals. I am the Lord. I will execute judgments against all the gods of Egypt. See what he was doing. It wasn't just plagues. Every, every plague represented what the Egyptians thought their gods could take care of. From light, the sun, to the, to the river, to the, to the animals. Every God was shown to be false. Verse 13, the blood on the houses where you are staying will be a distinguishing mark for you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. No plague will be among you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Because of what God had promised, the problem is slavery, captivity. The solution is the covenant. 
The solution is the agreement with God that they are his children and he will bring them into the promised land. So they, by faith, take the blood, put it over the door, stay in the house, the angel of death comes over, and then there is freedom. The bread is unleavened because they don't have time for the leaven to go through. It represents the fact they left in a hurry, swiftly, and now we have the point of celebration. Because at the end of the meal, whenever all was said and done, the Israelites gathered all of their things and the plunder they had get, gotten from their Egyptian masters, and they left, they left Egypt on their way to the Promised Land. As God institutes this annual celebration, the Passover, one more passage in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 16. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 1. He says, set, a month, set aside the month of Habib, that's also Nisan, and observe the Passover to the Lord your God, because the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night in the month of Abib. Sacrifice to the Lord your God a Passover animal from the herd or flock in the place where the Lord chooses to have his name dwell. Do not eat leavened bread with it. For seven days you are to eat unleavened bread with it, the bread of hardship, because you left the land of Egypt in a hurry, so that you may remember, you may remember, you may remember for the rest of your life the day you left the land of Egypt. We have a thing about our memories. We have a thing about spiritual amnesia. We have a thing about presumption and assumption and arrogance and pride. We have a, a thing about being myopic, about how we see things and see the world around us. We get a little bit selfish. We get a little bit um, um, self-centered. We get a little too concerned with ourselves and not, not understanding the glory and the majesty of God. And in the midst of it, God, in his providence and his wisdom, tells his children, I'm delivering you. I'm redeeming you. I'm bringing you out of slavery, out of captivity. But I know you. I know you're going to forget. I know you're not going to remember me. I know you're not going to remember what I've done. So every year, I want you to come back, and I want you to remember the bread, and I want you to remember the juice, and I want you to remember, I want you to remember every part of this so that you can be celebrating who you are in me and the covenant that you and I have. So the Passover became a ritual, a tradition, a part of the Jewish religion. And as the years progressed, year after year, they would go and they would celebrate. They would go to the temple. They would go to Jerusalem. They would go and they would have the lamb. And on the 10th day, they would select the lamb. And on the 14th day of the month, they would sacrifice the lamb. They would take the blood and the blood would represent the, the innocent sacrifice, knowing, realizing that in the midst of this, something bigger, something greater is coming, something greater is happening. Because they realized as, as the blood shed, as the life was spilt, that there had to be a sacrifice for the sin that they had. It had to be voluntary, it had to be innocent, but they kept trying again and again and again, year after year, sacrifices after sacrifices. They, they needed God, they needed his provision. They needed to celebrate the redemption they had in him, but there was more. You see, this story doesn't stop with the story of Exodus. Actually, that's just one piece. Because as you, you dig into the Passover and you dig into the covenant and you dig into the bread and to the wine and all the elements that's involved, you see that there's, there's a couple of more pieces that have to fit for this to work. See, for just a minute, can I talk to you about the story of the kingdom? See, it's not, just, it's not just about a bunch of chosen people thousands of years ago leaving Egypt. This story is much bigger than that. It represents so much more than just you and I reading a history book. It represents something that started at the very beginning of creation. I would dare say it began before creation, before time even began. As Adam and Eve in the garden, as they walked with God, something despicable happened. They turned. They rebelled. And it wasn't just their sin it was what they did that infected us. Their disease was spread by DNA, by culture, by, by um, passing down through the genes. We got the sin. We got the sin nature. And because of that rebellion, because of that sin, because of being in the garden, they rebelled against God, and everyone who descends from Adam and Eve have that same sinful nature, that same problem of a great divide between us and a righteous, holy, honorable, majestic, sovereign God. We can't do it. We can't get there from here. 
All we know is that we're broken and we have a bias. And we know either by our nature or by our nurture, by our choices as well as by our heritage, that we cannot get to God. So we have a desperate problem with the kingdom of God, with the reign of God, with the sovereignty of God, because we are so dead in our sin, we can't even begin to see how desperately we need God. But there's a solution. You see, Jesus, at the Last Supper, was the last Passover because now what Jesus is doing is he is transitioning from the old into the new. The old covenant into the new covenant. Let me show you how he says it. Luke chapter 22, the first few verses that we read this morning. Luke chapter 22, verse 14. He says, when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. Then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Now, there's a couple of things here in verse 15 I can't leave without you seeing, without me pointing out. I'm sure you see it. I'm just going to say it because you already know it, but I'm going to say it anyway. Verse 15, fervently desired, desire upon desire, passionately want you to be here. I want to do this. I've been wanting to do this. I've been anticipating this. And before I suffer. The fact that Jesus voluntarily went to the cross. No one killed Jesus. Jesus voluntarily surrendered his life. Pilate didn't kill him. The Jews didn't kill him. Judas didn't kill him. Nobody killed him because that implies murder and innocent victim. He surrendered himself as a voluntary sacrifice so that we would have life. He knew he was going to do it and he didn't avoid it. He planned for it. He was the Passover lamb before the creation of the world. He knew all along that he was going to be doing this. He has been desiring it. He's been desiring it because of what this means, because what the Passover once meant and what it's going to mean now, what the Lord's Supper will start with, what we will be able to celebrate and enjoy and appreciate. You see, the thing is, Jesus sitting there at the table in the upper room, Jesus with his disciples, a cloak of secrecy because he said, I want to send a couple of guys ahead, find the guy who's carrying the water jar, which is very uncommon for that day and age, go to that room. He didn't want Judas to know in advance. He didn't want, he didn't want his plan to be thwarted by man's plan because he's God. He's sovereign. He was taking care of business. Every moment, Jesus was taking care of business. He's sitting in the upper room with his disciples, and as he's sitting there, he's anticipating what's going to be happening in their life and in the lives of the next generation and the next generation all the way to right here and if the Lord tarries further on. Knowing what he's doing, why he's doing it, how he's doing it, and the perfect timing for him to do it. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that Jesus was there. Jesus was there in the garden, in the cool of the day when he walked with Adam and Eve. Jesus was there when Abraham was sitting in his tent and the visitors came to visit. Jesus was there when Jacob wrestled with the angel. Jesus, Jesus was there when Moses, in fear, ran for his life and then heard him speak out of the burning bush. Jesus, Jesus was planning this before creation. Jesus was there every step of the way. He was God incarnate. Sometimes we get that confused and we, we say incarnate, then God. No, he was God incarnate. He has always been, always will be God. He was there. He knew the story of Abraham. Abraham was his creation. Before Abraham was, he, I am. He knew all of that. Jesus is God. He was there when the plagues came and Pharaoh hardened his heart. He was there when the darkness descended. He was there when the death erupted. He was there. He was there when the children of Israel ran. He was there when the water came out of the rock. He was there when the manna descended in the quail. He was there. Every step of the way, he was there. Because this isn't just a story about Israelites coming out of Egypt. It's much bigger than that. It's about the kingdom and the sovereignty of God. The problem is, the problem is that we try to, to fit our understanding and our worldview and our experiences and our heritage into his story when it's his story, not ours. We're a part of his creation. He's not a part of ours. We don't get to make God in our image. So here we have the problem of the sin nature, of this division with God, this great divide. 
And God says, the only way I'm going to be able to bring you back, my way, my plan A, my number one, no plan B, this is it, is by the covenant. The only solution is going to be by you coming into relationship with me, the kingdom of God reigning forever and ever. And so what he does in, in Luke chapter 22, he says, I fervently desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So he knows he's going to suffer. He knows he's doing this willingly. And he continues in verse 16. Luke chapter 22, verse 16. He says, for I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Jesus knew this. He knew this is not the end. And he knew just after he said he was going to suffer, that his death was not going to be permanent. He knew this. And as he's speaking to his apostles and therefore speaking to us, he says, I got this. There's going to be a period there's going to be a season, there's going to be a time where the now is going to be separated by the not yet, where there is going to be an existence, but it's not going to be fulfillment. There's going to be life, but it's not going to be fulfilled. It's not going to be all. You are going to have the spirit of God, but you're not going to be fully known as you once will be, one day will be. All of the things that we dream of, all of the things we anticipate, all of the things that Jesus has promised us, he says it's coming. And you've got it. You've got the earnest money. You've got the deposit of the Holy Spirit, but it's not all there yet. He said, it's coming. So he takes, he takes the last Passover, the last time he's going to eat it on this earth. He says, this food I'm, I'm eating, this bread, I'm not going to eat it again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he says it again with the cup, verse, 12, uh, verse 17. He says, then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, regular Passover, Take this and share it among yourselves, for I tell you from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. The story is not over. You have yet to experience the rest of the story. Remember Paul Harvey? You've yet, you've yet to see what God is going to do. With all that he's done, there's still more coming. He said, anticipate that. In faith, Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. In faith, believe that the covenant is not over, that the story is not finished, that there is more coming. Realize that Jesus, as he's, he's celebrating this Passover, as he's done it year after year after year, after he's honored God the Father as God the Son, as he's, as he's sat around the table, as he's seen the blood shed, as he's seen the sacrifices and the offerings, every time over and over again, realizing that he's that lamb, he's that sacrifice. He's the ultimate, perfect, voluntary giving of himself so that we can have life. Jesus does this. The story of the kingdom, the problem is we're sinners. The solution is his grace, the covenant. The celebration is that we no longer, we no longer have to do the Passover because we have something greater, which brings us to the story of the Savior. The story of the Savior. See, the problem is Moses' law just points out what's wrong. It doesn't save us. It's not possible to save us. We need a sacrifice. We need an innocent sacrifice, but we need one that won't be temporary and have to offer the sacrifice over and over and over again. And we need a sacrifice and we need a salvation that's going to be for the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The problem, the solution is the covenant. So we come to the table and we see Luke chapter 22, verse 19. And he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to them and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The bread used to represent the unleavened bread, the matzah bread, the broken bread. It used to represent getting out of Egypt in a hurry. Now it represents something much greater, the body of Jesus Christ. This body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. Verse 20, in the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. No longer do we see the bread of Passover as it once was, now we see it as it once is, now is. No longer do we see the cups as they once were, now we see them as they are. It's not a blood of a lamb or a goat. It's the blood of Jesus. And it's still symbolic. It's still showing what he has done and who he is. 
But we no longer need the Mosaic Law. We no longer need the Day of Atonement where the, the priest would put his hands on the goat and the goat would go out into the wilderness. They called it a scapegoat because they would say all of the sins would be put on that goat and he would go out and the sins would depart the tent, the depart the nation of Israel. We no longer need that because the greatest scapegoat has lived and died and rose again for us. We no longer need the Mosaic law, the cultural law, the ceremonial laws. We no longer have to watch our diet because he's created all things. No food is unclean because he is the creator of all. We no longer have to obey the Sabbath laws because there is a new Sabbath in town. The Sabbath is not about the seventh day of the week and having rest. This is more about a Sabbath and who he is. He is the new Sabbath. Hebrews chapter 4, 5, and 6. Read it later. It's really cool. There's nothing to keep us from him because the temple is no longer necessary. You see, now that we are believers in Jesus Christ, once you accept him as Savior, you become a part of the body of Christ, and you, the Spirit of God living inside of you, you become the temple, the living temple, temple with spiritual stones that are built one upon another. And so the story continues to such an extent, to such an extreme, that now we don't have to go to a piece of bread and a, piece, a drink of juice. We no longer have to worry about how we're going to please God because God is inside of us, living inside of us, wells of, of living water gushing forth from us because of what he has done for us. We no longer need the ceremonial law. We no longer need the temple. We don't, we don't need the Holy of Holies. We don't need to go inside because he's inside us. He's in the body. On the day that he died, Jesus hanging on the cross, the temple in the, in the, the curtain in the temple, it tore. The thickness of a fist tore from top to bottom. It was not an accident. It was representation of the fact that everything division, everything dividing has been torn apart. We no longer need the things of old. We no longer need to, to follow the Jewish law, the Jewish culture. According to Ephesians chapter 2, we are, the two have become one. He has, he has abolished the dividing wall of hostility, not so that Jews can become better Jews or that Gentiles can become Jews, but both Jews and Gentiles have both come down so that God can bring them up as one man. Now we belong to Jesus. The same Jesus who created the heavens and the earth and we live and move and have our being, the same Jesus who was there every step of the way in his story, the same Jesus who was foretelling and foreshadowing, who created David, yet said David is his Lord, yet he was David's Lord. The same Jesus over and over and over again in the scripture gives us his story so that we can get to this point and realize this is not accident, this is not a fluke, this is not just kind of all the things lining up together, how nice, how sweet. This is Jesus working for us. We don't need any more sacrifices. He's the ultimate sacrifice. We don't need any more blood. He gave all the blood that's needed. We don't need anything else because now, because of what Jesus has done, we have moved from the old covenant into the new covenant. He didn't abolish it. He fulfilled it. He didn't get rid of the old covenant. He said, you don't need the old wine skins anymore. Now we have the new ones. You don't need to live according to the law anymore because now you live in me. Now you get to be with me and you are free, free indeed. The Egyptians, they captured the Israelites. They oppressed and enslaved the Israelites. Temporarily, physically, Jesus comes in to us, the slaves. He says, I'm not going to do that. I'm not just going to free you physically. That's temporary. I'm going to take you out of a prison that you created yourself, and I'm going to set you free. And he looks over God the Son at God the Father, and he says, let's let our people go. We are free because of what he's done for us. When we understand that, when we get to the point of that celebration, of that joy, then we can see why 1 Corinthians 11, when he says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is not about just another religious exercise. This is about a divide that was so great that there was nothing to get us from us to God other than the cross. The cross to bridge the great divide. We needed the blood. We needed the salvation. We needed the Passover. But just to point us to the real thing. 
See, of all of the elements of Scripture, you go from Genesis to Revelation. You have some beautiful stories and some wonderful characters, and all of it is true because the author cannot lie. But all of those things are like little moons that pale in comparison of a blazing sun of Jesus Christ. They're all good and they're wonderful and I love reading the stories and, and if you haven't, I encourage you to, to dig in. But all of it just pales when you come to the story of Jesus. The greatest story ever told. Because of his sacrifice for us, because of what he did for us, we have new life. And we're no longer we're no longer in bondage to sin. You see, what he did on that cross is in the past, he took care of the penalty. He said, paid in full. It is finished. So everything that sin has cost us, even to the point of wages of sin being death, Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 6, even everything that we are guilty of, he has said, paid in full. Teletestai. That's the past. But not just that, but also the present. Because of what Jesus has done on the cross, because the Spirit of God is living within us, we can also celebrate the fact that we have the power of sin broken in our life. It doesn't mean that we're perfect, but it does mean that we no longer have to live under the chains, under the mastery, under the, the kingdom of the devil, but now we live under the kingdom of Christ. And in that freedom, the power of sin has released us. It, it, it no longer controls us. The power of God has released us from the power of sin. Romans chapter 6. But there's another part. The very presence of sin will be disappeared on that day when we sit around the table again. When we get to be with him again. You see, our faith is not just uh, in the sweet by and by and hope everything works out and it's going to be okay in the end. Oh, it's much more than that. Everything we believe in eternity makes us worth living on earth here. Everything we understand and see and live for forever and ever in God's kingdom means it's going to translate in how we act and react, how we live and we thrive here on his earth. You see, it's not by accident that Jesus told us to pray, taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, as he's called us to do it his way. But we forget. And so we have to be reminded we have spiritual amnesia. We come again and again to God and ask, would you please wake me up from my stupor? Would you please help me to remember who you are and what that makes me because of who you are? You see, this story, Exodus, kingdom, savior, it's his story. If you've never heard it before, I almost envy you because you haven't been weighed down with all the silliness that we intend to put on top of it. But if you've heard it and you've dismissed it, I pity you because this is the story that gives us life. The Bible calls it the gospel. The life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As the musicians come forward, I want to ask you, as, as listeners, what are you going to do with this story? If it's going to stay in the category of make-believe, it's going to be something you just remember and fondly think of days to come. And if someone asks you what the gospel is, what it means, the Passover and the Lord's Supper and all of these elements, what, what's the big deal? Or... Will it be life for you? Will it be your reason for getting up in the morning and going to bed at night? Will it be your source of satisfaction as well as joy? Will it be the understanding Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness? Will it be the understanding that we are saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves, lest any man should boast? Will, will it be the way that you not just live, but live abundantly? Will this be your life? See, we're not into religious ritual. We're not into the barrenness of a busy life. We're into new life, born again, Jesus Christ. We don't pity Jesus because Jesus is God. We don't dismiss. We don't disrespect. We don't ignore. We let God open our eyes. And then by his grace and his power and his sovereignty, we let him change our heart. If that's your need this morning, the altar will be open. Pastors and deacons will be available. This is your time. 
We're not going to prolong it. I'm not going to sing 23 verses of Just As I Am. I'm going to give you just a couple. If there's movement, we'll keep going. But otherwise, this is you. If you're hesitant, i got to ask you why. I just told you the best story they ever heard. Come. Would you pray with me, please? Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you do. And thank you for what you're going to do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Just stand with me, please. To your majesty and your beauty I surrender. standing for just a moment. I'm going to ask Carla to come up. Mary, you want to come with her? Jean, you want to come up here too or you want to stay back there? It's up to you either way. So whatever you're comfortable with. Actually, if you want to keep going because you're going to dismiss us, aren't you? Yeah. Just, um, Carla wants to come. Uh, she, I don't know if you were here earlier, but she was just baptized. So you, you were, okay, you're good. Uh, she's accepted Christ's Savior, followed him in baptism, wants to become a part of our church. And so if you are a member of First Baptist and want to hold her accountable, love on her, let her grow in her faith and allow her to do the same for, for you, would you please say amen? Amen. Amen. Welcome. So we're going to let you stay here, and folks are going to come after the closing prayer, which I'm hoping you're about to do real quick. Okay. Do you want to do it down here, or you want to go up there? Okay. All right. Go right ahead. Go ahead. I'll, after closing prayer, we'll let you come and, and greet her. Let me remind you that the, the blood mobile uh, Dracula is down the hall, so um, in the outside. So go outside the parking lot, turn your left. They need, they're in a desperate situation. He asked me specifically to, to say something to you. So if you're available, uh, please uh, make, make note of that. Great story. This is the result of that great story. Um, just a little bit about she came to be with us here several months back, and you guys have loved her to the Lord so that she wants to know Christ as Savior, and she has, and now followed the Lord in baptism. Praise God. Fathers, we come with again this morning. What a joy it is to be able to come before your presence. And fathers, we, as we hear this story one more time, it never grows old, never grows old, because we're reminded once again of your incredible love for us. Father, may we take this story and not keep it to ourselves, but share it with someone else. Thank you for the blessings that you're going to give us today. And as we go through this week, Father, may our lives 
reflect your glory. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' precious name, amen. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you and God bless.